dal ure tu te erton helvenum, se et in nama ia halchot, tobe cum et in rice. Thy kingdom come, on earth as it is in heaven, and give us this day. Do you hear me, Lord? It is summer of the year 999. For 400 years we people of Englalonda prayed to Christ. Do not forsake us, Lord, in our time of need. And lead us not into temptation. And deliver us from evil. Anglo-Saxon England, by the year 1000, was a very highly organized Christian country. It had a hierarchy, with the king at the top and different grades of people, thanes, free men, and the slaves knowing their places. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is our main source of evidence for the events around the year 1000. And it's a very pessimistic outlook. This was a very prosperous country, but increasingly vulnerable at the time to organize attacks from the north, from the Vikings. In 995 came the long-haired comet, token of evil. 998, a Viking host seized the Isle of Wight. And now, 999, the Viking fleet has sailed up the Medway, burning and slaying in the Shire of Kent. Englalond is a land of small villages stretching from here in Kent to Northumbria. Our king, Ethelred, is far to the west in his capital, Winchester. I am Cuthbert, village priest, a man of learning. In this, my chronicle, I write about the 40 God-fearing souls of my village, true folk of Englalond. This village is our world. <laughs> For 600 years, our forefathers have awoken in this place. They came across the sea to settle this island when the Romans left. Angles and Saxons, they were heathens then. But now we've seen the light of Christ. Wolfrich, eager blacksmith's son, First to empty his bladder, unloading last night's hornfuls of ale. Our kindreds live close around their hearth, woken by their children or the call of the cock. Not always in good temper. Fleas and lice are our bedmates under the thatched roofs. What day, Wolfrich? Let's help Gunnhild. Gunnhild, she's still not betrothed. She must wed soon. Lord, keep her from sin. West Isle. Please What really mattered to the Anglo-Saxons was health, physical health. And so, why is Hal? Be whole, be healthy. It was a typical top of the morning greeting. They were practical, earthy. I suppose that if you or I were tuning in to Anglo-Saxon um, channel just now, it would sound rather harsh um, and gravelly, a bit like waves dashing in up on a shingle beach. Eager, shall the harder, pay to the kena, mood to the mara, to the magan litlath. All the words that come from our language that are good and short and tough and blunt and terse and hard and quick come from Anglo-Saxon. Womb, woman, man, earth, sea, ship, air, sky, love. Everyday life was definitely a struggle. It was hard physical work. The average Anglo-Saxon was much fitter than we are. 
and they'd be much less likely to be overweight than people are now. That really wasn't a problem for the Anglo-Saxons. Only the very rich would ever get a chance to get fat. We don't think people actually washed very much at all. You know, it's a bit hard for somebody who works on this period to say that we're actually dealing with a period of people who were really smelling. Our village life is rooted in the land. We live alongside goats, pigs and poultry. We're hardy, not squeamish. We must rear and grow all we need. A hundred years ago, King Alfred cast out the Viking raiders. But in my lifetime, in the reign of King Ethelred, the heathens from Daneland have come back to threaten our Christian people. There's work to do, taxes to pay, so that the king's army can keep the unbelievers at bay. By the year 1000, Anglo-Saxon society was very highly organized. There was a very developed hierarchy with the king at the top and the slaves at the bottom and different grades of people in between. Slaves, we call them thralls, have lowest rank. They do heavy work with the pigs and the plough. They're chattel, left in wills, bought and sold. They carry no weapons, own no land. We shelter them, but if they run away, they may be stoned to death. No. That is our law. Slaves may not sit beside their lord. This is the slave's overseer, Godwin. His wife's heavy with child. He can't read like me, but he's learned to count. He's our reeve, the bailiff and collector for our thane, the local nobleman, Edwin. Godwin's a rich freeman, a churl, as we call them. His father left him over 60 acres in his will. Godwin grows barley, wheat and leeks. Or rather, the slaves grow barley, wheat and leeks for him. That's their place. One may end up as a slave in Anglo-Saxon society through a variety of pathways, and one of these could be as a captive in a skirmish or battle. You could also be born into slavery. You could also end up as a slave if, say, you had been convicted of a crime, you were unable to pay the fine that was required of you, then you would end up in penal slavery. Alvich is our blacksmith, a less wealthy freeman. He makes tools and weapons, and so is given a 20-acre holding from our thane. Like his forefathers, Alrich passes on his craft to his son, Wolfrich. But in war, there's more call for arrowheads and shields than for church crosses. And we mustn't overlook the weefmen, the women, or we'll never hear the end of it. Their hands, like the Lord's hands, are never idle. Every morning they grind the quern to give us our daily bread. <laughs> Elsa, Elsa, my water. Making bread was women's work. It was one of the hardest, most time-consuming things that they did basically because of grinding the flour. One of the reasons that they didn't make all their corn into bread was that grinding flour was such hard work and took such a long time. There's a big difference actually between Anglo-Saxon teeth and modern teeth because of course their flour was stone ground and little bits of grit would come off into the flour. So all the time people were eating bread they were grinding their teeth down. And by the time somebody was, well, I suppose, in late middle age, they might actually have no enamel left on the tops and bottoms of their teeth at all. Could have been quite painful. Life in one of the wooden houses it would have been quite cosy because they would have had a fire going all the time. It would have been smoky. All the smoke would have gone up to the upper half. And we do know that quite a lot of them suffered from sinusitis, presumably contracted from sitting around in smoky environments.
The train deposits obviously contain people's bodily waste, but also intestinal parasites, particularly worms, tapeworm that we have now, and then they had whipworm, and there was a nasty one called Ascari, which they had as well, which could be about a foot long. Of course, they didn't have toilet paper. What they did use were leaves, moss, anything that was reasonably soft. There's actually a joke. What is the cleanest leaf? And the answer is holly, because, of course, it would be quite unsuitable for that purpose. We know they combed their hair because we find their combs, lots of combs, quite elaborately made. Some of those combs have knits on them. Women, certainly married women, would wear a cloth over their head all the time that they were outside. There was some kind of belief that women's attraction lay in their hair. You know, there's a pretty girl with nice long blonde hair. And you know, once somebody was married, she wasn't supposed to be attractive to everybody else. No veil yet for Kunhild. She's unwed. Her father, Oswald, is away fighting the Vikings. Her charms have been noted by Godwin's brother, Edmund, a wealthy churl and an ungodly bully. Kicked by his horse, they say. Kunhild's father is in our Thane's war band, part of the feared, the Angler army, tracking down the Viking foe. Wolfrich has been chosen one day to take his place at our Thane's side. It's a great honor for a mere blacksmith's son. He could win booty, be granted his own land. All the better to win over some girl. War, of course, provided opportunities for people, as well as causing many problems. So there was much more social mobility than there had been before. And someone who perhaps hadn't had the chance to become a soldier, and then possibly to improve his status, uh, might well find that uh, a place was available for him in the third, because so many other men had died. Kuhnhild has more than one swain seeking her hand. Wolfridge, he may not come back from war. Edmund, his wealth may turn Kunhild's head in time. Praise the Lord. The joy of giving life. The main thing about childbirth was that it was extremely painful. It was the curse of Eve that you have to suffer to bring forth children. And in the year 1000, there was no effective pain relief. Life expectancy, on average, was very low. The worst time was the first five years of life, and within that, the time around birth. But childbirth was really a female thing. All the women in the village would probably come and help. So there would be a whole load of women in the house, and the men probably wouldn't be anywhere to be seen. It is Lethe, midsummer. Tomorrow I christen Godwin's kin. 
I follow meekly in the footsteps of St. Augustine, who came from Rome 400 years ago to baptize us Engler. My flock are God-fearing, but theirs is a life of toil. As priest, I seek truly to unfold the Gospels to them. In the year 1000, there was still going on a revival in the church, which had begun in the reign of Ethelred's father, Edgar, and it was beginning to have an effect on village communities. Ordinary people would now be expected to go to church perhaps more frequently than they had done before, but the, the great hope of the reformers was that the parish priest would explain to people what Christianity was about, what the meaning of the services was, and how they could infuse it into their everyday lives. Baptism around the year 1000 was very similar to a baptism service today. The role of the godparent was important. The role of the family was very important as well. It was in fact the defining moment in becoming a Christian. You needed to be baptized to be a Christian. Oswald, old Wayand, warrior of our settlement, Kuhnhild's father, has been gravely wounded. Our Lord Thane Edwin has ridden over 30 miles to bring him back from the field of battle. The first thing for a wound would be a salve, I suppose, to cover it up and to soothe it. And those would be usually made of fat with some herbs in them. But it was also understood that it was important to keep wounds clean, so they would be cleaned with things like honey. Of course, even if a wound had apparently healed up, somebody could still become ill. They could get what we now understand as blood poisoning, so they'd be feverish and they'd be debilitated and they could even die in the end. It's hard to see Oswald growing many more grey hairs. A harsh outcome for such a worthy man. I pray he lives for the sake of his daughter, poor Kunhild. Lord, keep us from the Vikings bring death to our door. I have a sad tale to set down. It is the year of 999, last summer before 1000. While King Ethelred cowers in land, Vikings rob our kingdom. <laughs> our warrior Oswald has fallen foul of the heathen swords and lies dying. His daughter, Kunhild, can only watch his faring forth. <laughs> The king was King Ethelred II, who has the nickname the Unready. That's in fact a play on his name, Ethelred Noble Council, Unred, 
no counsel or possibly ill counseled and it's thought that he got his name from being badly advised by some of the nobles around him. Soon after Ethelred had come to the throne in 978, Viking raids began again. And so by a thousand, there must have been a lot of fear and insecurity in many parts of the country. How many more warriors broke and bones will lie on this hill before the Vikings are done? Who guards us at this evil time? We pay twice over, once with the lives of our sons and again with our hard-earned silver. Tax was raised not only by the king in order to sort of swell his own coffers, but by around the year 1000, enormous <laughs> payments of silver were being made to the Vikings. For example, we find more Anglo-Saxon coins in the Viking homelands than we do in England. The thieving heathens will not take these, I pray. A sad day, but Oswald's silver will not go amiss in the work of Christ. The priest was responsible for burying the dead, and this often led to great disputes over where a particular person should be buried, because a payment had to be made to the priest upon the burial. And we know that priests often fought over corpses in a rather unceremonious manner uh, in order to acquire not just the corpse, but more importantly, the burial fee. Work stops for no man, even the dead. Summer comes to an end and we must ready ourselves for the cold months. Life must go on, even for poor Kunhild. Anglo-Saxon England was rich and that depended largely on sheep. The sheep is really the ideal multi-purpose animal. It's got the fleece, which you can use to make clothes, it'll keep you warm, it gives you meat, it gives you tallow, which you can use to make candles, and you can milk it as well. The silver penny goes right back to Anglo-Saxon England. And it was a coinage that was very much centralised. It was withdrawn every six years to be reminted. <laughs> One great concern, of course, was for the minting of false coins. And if a money was caught minting coins in the woods, is another way that they put it, then he could expect to have his hand chopped off and fastened above the doorway of his mint. This was a clear indication, then, um, that the, the person had wronged. No talk of coins today. My villagers must forget worldly sins, for it is Sunday. A day of rest for most, but a day of work for me, as I watch over my wayward flock. Priests were responsible for the pastoral care of villagers at this time and they were responsible for making sure that the villagers adhered to the religious feasts. They were responsible for making sure that the villagers went to church on a Sunday. And the, the law was very clear that villagers mustn't do any work at all on a Sunday or else they'd be fined. They weren't allowed to carry anything anywhere. And the priest was responsible for ensuring that that happened. So that might sometimes mean that the priest wasn't particularly popular. Fishing. I should find him. Washing was considered a luxury. It was something that nuns and monks gave up when they entered the monastery because it was, I suppose, an affectation. It was something that was nice, but that wasn't necessary. 
and the ordinary Anglo-Saxon peasant certainly never saw a bath and probably didn't wash very much at all either. What's she up to? Bathing. Bathing. Bathing can only lead to sin. Eve offers up the apple in my own garden. Do not eat, Wolfrich. The church has never had a very good opinion of any form of sex. Lawful marriage is the least of evils. It's not particularly good in itself. But all other forms of sex constantly fulminated against fornication, incest, rape, sleeping with nuns, you name it, some priest has complained about it. When it came to marriage, this wasn't an entirely personal choice. Marriages were contracted between families and women wouldn't have a lot of choice about who they were to marry. Although the law is clear that women weren't forced to marry someone that they didn't wish to marry. Kuhnhild has made her choice, but I fear Edmund has not given up. Ulfric is near Knapper, a smith is Kunabat land a loot. It will a do for Weaver, where your thumb near Thora land. Lahi! A gaff for a morning sunner! Oh! 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 All of the adult male villagers belonged to a tithing, which was almost like a local neighbourhood watch group, which was responsible for making sure that everybody adhered to the law. And that was re really the point of contact between the law, which was being created by the king and by his advisers, and local people. Beyond the tithing, the village works together to defend our kingdom. From making arrowheads to giving up a son to the feared, the army, our settlement gives sacrifice for the greater good. This may be the last time the blacksmith's two sons play together. It is time for Wolfrich to go and fight on our behalf. He may be cut down in battle. But of course, the price for running away would be shame and lawful death. I pray he will be more than just arrow fodder. Rich leaves our village to face the foe outside. Oh well, Napa. Toward each shire, our people build strongholds or burrs where armies muster. The war band heads to Hastings Burr with our thane Edwin. In the year 1000, the king, Ethelred, was a very weak and ineffectual king. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle records when the army was supposed to be going out, it was coming in. When the enemy were in the west, then the army mustered in the east. Viking raiders are near. Only God knows Wolfrich's fate now. The Anglo-Saxon sense of fate was that the shape of our life, the time we were born, the main events in our life, the time we die, was already determined. I think that the shapers, the gods, had nothing to say in shaping the colour of our lives. The way in which if we have a sense of humour, it can be a lot more bearable, even if we're suffering. Cuningus yeselda, quen met huilum, huit lockedu, hond on me. Habe me on belsme. Any event in the Anglo-Saxon period would lend itself to verse, which is how most people would have heard the news. The poet remained a key member of society, articulating the stories that told the English about themselves and about their origins, a medium by which, in other words, 
they identified themselves as English. What? We gardena and yerdachum theod kuninga thrum, ya frunon. Which loosely translated, what or what is almost the same word, drawing uh, uh, attention to the declamation that all would be hushed when the great word what went out. What, how we have heard of the erstwhile fame of the spear wielding folk kings of the days of yore. Oft, shul cherving, shehadana threatum. Beowulf is the great epic that forms the beginning of literary art in the English language. I wish my congregation was as rapt as this of a Sunday. They're always enthralled by the old tale handed down word of mouth of that monster killer Beowulf and those ale rowdy warriors in their hall. They have a great feast and there's, of course, singing in the feast. And it is to the sound of this singing that introduces us to the next major character in the poem, namely the monster Grendel. We hear the tale again. Grendel can't stand the sound of the singing. Grendel, perhaps the most frightening monster in all of English literature. It is quite possible to trace back the monster in the film Alien, or the monster in the film Predator to Grendel as their prototype. And Grendel is immune to edged weapons of any kind, which Beowulf is aware of, so he proposes to grapple him in a great wrestling match. And Grendel is surprised that one of his victims actually fights back and what's more gets him in, into a, a very strong wrestling hold that appears to be a kind of half Nelson. And eventually he does manage to wriggle and twist himself free, but at the cost of his own arm, which Beowulf is left hanging on to in the same grip. <laughs> Beowulf is enormously significant because it's been deepened into the most profound comment on human life. Someone who is a real thinker and who says, what on earth is our life about here on earth? How are we to make sense of it? Um, what are the principles that we must live by? And each selva salo, sacha what each heart <laughs> and by now everyone's getting a bit fed up and getting a bit more rowdy and a bit more stupid with ale or mead and they say go on tell us a riddle and maybe he starts asking a riddle he said well I've had enough of this why don't you tell me a riddle because the riddles are the song of the unsung labourer they're the songs of the illiterate no so Edmund give us riddles there are some riddles which are very saucy which purport to describe objects around the kitchen and uh, around the household, but actually describe parts of the female and male anatomy. Sterthal mean is sweared. Her stunde itch in bed. Nathan ruch natwar. Seo de mech newath. Weef wunden lock. What spith that air? <laughs> Kuhnhild is fearful for Wilfrich, who faces true monsters more fierce than Grendel. It is harvest monath, fall in the year of our Lord, 999. Since we were overcome at the Battle of Malden eight years ago, our people have feared the Viking men who raid our kingdom. My fellow churchmen whisper that the Vikings are the Antichrist who will bring the world to an end. And out into this darkness beyond our village has gone Wolfridge, our blacksmith's son with Thane Edwin fighting the Vikings.
The purpose behind the Viking raids around the year 1000 was to raise money. So they were partly looking to taking booty, but like many other early medieval peoples, they were relying upon taking tribute, by which they meant they were relying upon people paying them money to go away. So they tended to ravage an area, literally burning places down, killing cattle and even people, until they made such a nuisance of themselves that somebody would organize a tribute to take them away. As the raids got on, people would find it increasingly difficult to pay that money. Um, churches were having to sell their silver. Uh, men were having to sell their land. And if you didn't have any land to sell, you might even sell yourself or members of your family into slavery. The Viking attacks were seen as evidence for the wars, which in the Book of Revelations are mentioned as the type of thing that we'll see in the reign of Antichrist. And after that, there will be the end of the world. The church was very pessimistic about the Viking raids. Many churchmen thought that the Viking raiders were some sort of divine punishment from God because they hadn't been adhering to their prayers and hadn't been going to church enough. Undoubtedly, certain sections of the ecclesiastical establishment believed that the world would end 1,000 years after the birth of Christ or the death of Christ. Archbishop Wolfstan, who has left us a very impressive sermon addressing the English as Leovan men, beloved men, ye knoweth that south is, know what the truth is. This world is on Oster. This world is in haste. And hit Neolakath Dum Ender. And it rushes to its end. This is one of the most explicit references to the, the, the fact of the belief that the world would end in some form or other around about the turn of the first millennium. The Battle of Malden was the first time that the Anglo-Saxons suffered a serious defeat in this round of the new Viking attacks. One of the oldest and most respected Eldermen, Bertnoff, was killed, and I think this was a warning signal to the Anglo-Saxons that they could be in trouble. South Yegel! Give me a Molden! Nafray! Oot! 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 The lines which the elderman of the English, whose name is Berthnoth, speaks to the Danish herald, who's asking him for Danegeld rather than fighting a battle, could be applicable to any invader. One can imagine it being said to Napoleon or Hitler or even some of the bureaucrats in Brussels. When Berthnoth said, Ye hearest thou saileth her, what this folk saith? Translated, Do you hear, sailor, what this folk says? We'll give you spears as tribute and time-tested swords. What were the Vikings like? They were out eager. There's a terrific word in Beowulf. It describes a ship which was icy and eager to sail. Well, that's how I think of the Vikings. They were thrusting, confident, opportunistic, and enormously successful. They were also arrogant, cruel, and lacking in compassion. 
Battles at the time would be a horrific place to be. The only thing that kept men together was the fact that they knew the men around them. The archaeological evidence tends to come from skeletons and shows particularly that sword blows could be quite devastating, cleaving skulls, amputating limbs. Winter comes, but not all will live to see it. Some pigs we cannot feed all through the cold months. The time has come for them to feed us. One of the months in the autumn was called Blot Monas, which means blood months. They always wanted more meat because it was protein and fat that were least abundant in their diet. The Anglo-Saxons had far less variety of foodstuff than we do. And not all species that we think of as being native species existed then. They didn't have any potatoes. They didn't have any tomatoes. Leeks, they were very keen on leeks. That was their favorite vegetable and some kind of cabbage stuff. But they weren't very bothered about vegetables. What they really liked was meat. The archer would be looking for gaps in the line where men weren't concentrating on him so that he could try and get a clear shot. If you know that the arrows are coming, with a shield, it's relatively easy to defend yourself. The archer would be moving around as much as possible, trying to catch people who weren't concentrating on him. It has a fan, no! Anglo-Saxon beer would have looked cloudy. It's made basically in the same way as it is now, out of malted barley. People did drink a lot more beer than we would expect because the water wasn't necessarily very clean. They might have a nice well, but they might not. They might have to get their water from the river, and that would be the same river that they were throwing all their rubbish into, so they wouldn't be very keen to drink it. A happy day. Our Lord Thane Edwin and Wolfrich have come back. This time they fought off the Viking swords. They're safe. Till spring at least, when the Vikings will come again. Wolfrich has been lucky with war spoils. We should melt that down and make something for my church. Finnest <laughs> well. It's Anfe Lander. <laughs> I do think the Anglo-Saxons had a good time, or certainly capable of having a good time, as much as we are today. The idea of a great feasting hall presided over by a benign leader or king was very much their idea of heaven on earth, and for many of them, their idea of heaven itself. 
fighting all day and drinking all night. So what more could you want? The Anglo-Saxons are underrated. There's this extraordinary idea that before the Norman Conquest, it was a miserable dark age of savage peasants who had no idea how to organize life. Whereas in fact, Anglo-Saxon England is the starting point for much that we think of as valuable and significant about later medieval and modern England. Our language, our place names, our churches, many systems of government all go back to the Anglo-Saxon period. It's not true to say that the history of the country begins with 1066. That's a, a mere blip on the, uh, the history of the people of England. It is ye all. Dawn is near. On the first day of the thousandth year since the birth of our Lord. All seems well. Our future lies with the like of Wolfrich, Coonhild, and the children they'll bear. The world has not come to an end. Archbishop Wolfstam was wrong then. Life moves on. Will our people still be here in another thousand years? There are some characteristics of the English today and of the Anglo-Saxons which seem uncommonly like one another. What we have now, as the year 2000 dawns, is something stoical, kind of back-to-the-wall toughness. There's a melancholy, there's some fatalism, and I think there's a great love of ceremony, of doing things the right way, of ritual. In some, I think we'd be fools not to look back, to look forward. <laughs>